this week on The Travel Show. It's ladies' night in the Atlas Mountains. Join the historic cavalcade of Pancho Villa. And I'm stepping up to the plate in New York. I don't know if I'm going to be able to hear that hard, but I'm going to give it my best shot. There's no pressure got at all. This, I will let a this. little bit of pressure. We're starting this week by heading off to Morocco to join a hiking trip that's on trend. Around the world, some tour companies have reported that bookings for women's only adventure trips are up by a whopping 40%. So we sent Katmo to the Atlas Mountains to join a trekking group that's run solely for and by women. The Berber tribes have lived in the Atlas Mountains for thousands of years, in villages and towns dotted across the slopes and valleys. So I've been to Morocco before, but this is the first time I'm actually making it out into the mountains and I'm super excited about it. But it's also the first time that I'm going to take part in a women's only expedition. So let's see how that goes. Most of the women helping us on our two-day trip are Berber and trusted members of the community. Today we're walking through some of the clay villages in the Imgun Valley, deep in the high Atlas Mountains. I'm coming! Oh my gosh. Leading us is Hafida, Morocco's first female mountain guide. She qualified 25 years ago, very much a pioneer of the time. Hafida, how old is this place? Yeah, so we don't really know the age for this kind of work, but it can be like 11th century. Oh, wow. So we've just stopped for some mint tea in this castle-like building. <laughs> That's our host. 80% of women here can't read and earn very little, but a rise in these women-only tours are starting to provide an income for those who can now host us on their own terms without men present. How often does she put the henna on? The henna is not just for beauty. The henna is something because these people, they work very hard to the fields. And if you know henna is antiseptic. Um, to have women in the expedition and to have women hiking and to have women helping other women. I love this idea to make them women coming from far away, uh, Western women, to share them the life of the Berber women. In honor of our arrival, some of the locals are throwing us a party, but there's one rule. The Berber women often gather in the evenings to sing, dance and chat. They don't always dress up in their traditional outfits, but they wanted us to have the full experience, and they've kindly lent us their clothes. I'm actually wearing someone's bridal dress. So I've been wedged in the middle. Oh, and apparently the male musicians don't count as men, so it's all still considered above board.
Over breakfast, I catch up with Zina. She has long been an advocate for women's rights in Morocco and has pushed hard to launch these women-only tours. Zina, so what do women get out of this rather than joining a regular mixed group? In a country like Morocco where, uh, especially in places that are a bit conservative like here, um, it's really hard to, to be able to interact with the locals and especially with women locals if you come in a group of mixed tourists. Mm -hmm. In a group of women only, um, we actually can break some barriers and get to learn about the custom, the tradition, they will open up, the headscarves will, will fall down <laughs> when you're in their home and then they'll start to you know, talk to you as a woman to woman. How much difference does it make to their lives? Well, it can be quite a lot, you know, especially when, when you see that it's actually, um, it's not just a trend, it's something that's fast growing. Mm -hmm. We talk about 40% growth in women-only trips in the world. It's, it's a big part of the travel business now. So, so that means there is a need and that means if we can supply this need in a sense, we can help a lot of women and empower them and providing them with the income. It's a longer walk today, way off the beaten track, deep into the high Atlas Mountains. We're on our way to join a nomad family for the afternoon. They're part of the Ait Atta tribe of southeast Morocco. How many times have you come here to this bit, Hafida? I stopped counting, like uh, 200 times. It's really starting to hit now. Plus, it's so hot. Fatima is a widow. Normally, women would give up this lifestyle as it's considered a man's job. She lives in a cave with her daughter and has begun hosting female tourists to supplement her income. They also help out with the daily tasks, some staying for up to a week. This afternoon, it's getting the goats back into the pen to milk. Sounds simple enough. What do I do? Wash money. Wash money. Wash money. the faster way to do it. There we are. There we are. Oh, someone is escaping. I'm not sure I was the most effective goat herder. This is not working. I, I can't even get a drop of milk. Yeah? <laughs> Fatima and her daughter often spend time with other nomads in the area. They've come to help her this afternoon. Most what she likes that everybody is happy and they are dancing and making fun. What type of dancing? The music here is Ahidu Susi. I can see why these trips are becoming so popular. We've met some wonderful women who've welcomed us into their world. And although I'd been to Morocco before, it sometimes felt like I was only experiencing half the story, half its people. But now I'm leaving with maybe more of an understanding of the country and its customs, and an appreciation for the women who live here in these challenging but stunning mountains. Catmo reporting there from Morocco. And if you're planning on heading there, here are the travel show's top tips for what to know before you go. If it's more of a city exploration you're looking for in Morocco, why not go beyond Marrakesh and try Fez? Step inside its beautiful walled city, Medina, and alongside the colourful tanneries associated with Morocco, you'll find the city alive with culture, especially in late June during the Fez Festival of World Sacred Music. 
showcasing spiritual music from around the globe. Further afield, every September, the village of Emilchil in Morocco's Middle Atlas Mountains celebrates Musem. 30,000 people from the surrounding Berber tribes gather for the three-day marriage festival. It's a spectacle of romance with couples meeting and marrying. Or pack your running shoes for something more active. The Morocco Trail Race is also happening this September. At distances ranging from 10 kilometers to 144, it's for a range of levels. But unlike most races, the idea is to meet local people and get a taste of Berber mountain life at the same time. Still to come on The Travel Show. We travel stateside to visit a town which enjoys a cross-border celebration with Mexico for one day a year. And I discover the street sport that's entertained generations of New Yorkers. Keep the eye on the ball. <laughs> ah! <laughs> Don't say it. Oh, I'm Don't not, say no. it. <laughs> I need a bit more practice. <laughs> so don't go away. This week, I'm in New York City outside the legendary Yankee Stadium. Now, each year, around three and a half million locals and tourists come here to enjoy one of America's favorite sports, baseball. The first recorded baseball match in the United States was played in the 1840s, just over the river in New Jersey. It saw New York square off against the Knickerbockers. And since then, the sport has become a way of life for many. And what do you think New York would be without baseball? Boring. <laughs> just how many baseball-centric items do you have in here? Because there's a lot. We have probably close to 10,000 pieces on the show. Wow, nearly 10,000. Yeah. Recently, we just added the Holy Grail of baseballs. That's signed by Pope John Paul II. He's actually <laughs> a saint. So as I like to tell people, I've got one baseball signed by an actual saint and almost 4,000 signed by sinners. <laughs> Later, I'll be trying my hand at a street version of baseball that's entertained generations of New Yorkers. But first, we're heading to the Mexican border with the United States, where in 1916, a raid led by the Mexican revolutionary, General Pancho Villa, on the American town of Colombo, New Mexico, escalated into a full-blown battle with the US Army. Today, the event brings the two communities together. I'm one of the founders of the uh, Cabo Gata that uh, approaches and joins with Columbus in, in a celebration and remembrance of the Pancho Villa raid in uh, 1916. La cabalgata son dos semanas. Llueva, trueno, relampague. Si eres un buen jinete, tienes que aguantar todo el recorrido. Van las características del caballo, tanto en la parte lateral, frente, parte trasera. Many Americans that get on their horses, they come down and they meet them at the border. And they kind of commingled at that time. And then they all come up together. The march up, the three, three miles march from the border to here, it's symbolic. Everybody just enjoys that, to see these people come here 
and remember that this was part of their history. We have uh, speeches, singing, dancing. You know, you go around, you walk around, and shake hands with Pancho Villa, which is a lot of fun. We never celebrated the raid, per se. We acknowledged that it happened. But we're, this is 100 years later. Nobody alive now was in that raid or had any part to do with it. So this is strictly for friendship with people that live on, below the border and people that live on this side of the border. Yo pienso seguir hasta que Dios me dé fuerza, salud para poder continuar. And to finish off, I'm heading north to New York, where a street version of baseball has been played for decades. It's called stickball. If you come to the Bronx in the spring or summer, there's a street called Stickball Boulevard, where most Sundays, the Emperor's Stickball League keep this tradition alive. Okay, so as far as I can tell, each player has three attempts to serve the ball, one attempt to hit it. If they miss the ball, they're out. If they hit it, it's about getting to first base, second base, etc. To keep the game going, the street is closed off to traffic. There's a lot of smack talk as well, a lot of smack talk. In fact, I've been told smack talk accounts for 90% of the game. <laughs> but there's also, you know, a lot of camaraderie. Everyone's just having fun. It's just about a bunch of friends getting together, hanging out. How did you get into it? We all washed up baseball players. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's part of it. But the, 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 the other thing is it's, it's a tradition. Stickball is just a tradition that's always happened in New York City. And a lot of our parents kind of like put us into the game. My family's been playing, wow, over 50 years. I remember a young kid going to see my uncles play downtown. <laughs> that's really cool. Check what you into it. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> Stickball's popularity continued throughout the 1950s and 60s, and tourists can revisit that period in Manhattan's Tenement Museum, which recreates a typical apartment from the time. There were tons of tenements, which were cheap places for people to live. Sometimes even nine, ten people per apartment in the space oh, that we're wow. in right now. Obviously overcrowded and cramped, it was also fun because everyone would have been out in the street. People would have been socialising, people would have been shopping. Stickball was a game with a very low cost of entry. Really, the only thing you needed was a broom handle, which most households had, yeah. and some sort of ball. And if you didn't have one, they only cost a couple of cents. As you see, they're made of um, a kind of cheap rubber or, or leather. Really, you could use anything to play this game. You know, it was very ad hoc. And that rough and ready homemade approach continues today. Nearly all of you have customised your bats. What are they made from? Wood, most of them. Yeah, we, they're closet poles. Yeah, we go to Home yeah. Depot yeah. and you know what I mean? We pick them, they're closet rods, poles, whatever you want to call them. New York Emperor Stickball League was established in the mid 80s. Uh, we've got approximately 100 members playing stickball. One of the league's founders was called Steve Mercado. He was a fireman in Engine Company 40 who died in the 9-11 attacks. It was his vision to just try to push this, advance this league. To, to, he always wanted it to be a, 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 an Olympian event. So Memorial Day weekend, we have teams from California coming. We have teams from uh, Florida, Orlando, Miami, yeah, yeah. Tampa. We constantly try to uphold the vision for him. His two sons, as a matter of fact, play in the league now, but it's yeah. just a legacy that we just want to continue from there. The power of some of these swings, you can just, you can hear it. 
I don't know if I'm going to be able to hear that hard, but I'm going to give it my best shot. All right, let's go. Come on. Let's do it. Let's grab a stick right here for you. This one right there. Okay. All right. Let it bounce once. Yeah. Step into the ball. Okay. <laughs> okay. I feel like the, the, the ball clipped the bat. I'm going for a clean hit this time. All right, so this time you got to run the first base. All right. Now they're going to talk trash, though. <laughs> Keep the eye on the ball. <laughs> Don't say it. Uh, I'm Don't not, say not, it. No, no. Okay. Just toss it out. That's good. There you go. Run it out. Run it out. Let go of the bat. <laughs> I think I'm going to leave it to the professionals. I need a bit more practice. <laughs> I might be done, but if you want to catch some stickball, the Emperor's League Big Blowout Memorial Day competition takes place next weekend. Well, that's your lot for this week, but coming up on next week's travel show. I'm going to be looking back at a white knuckle start to the year on the program. Like when Addy experienced life in the fast lane in Dubai. Wow, we that was incredible. So much raw power. We're about to set off 100 kilometers down a very icy hill. And Krista took on a bobsled ride in Latvia. <laughs> oh man. Woo! I think that's one of the most intense experiences of my entire life. <sighs> that was completely insane. Whew. Don't forget, you can keep track of us wherever we are in the world on our social media. But for now, from me, Lucy Hedges, and the rest of the Travel Show team here in the Bronx, it's goodbye. <laughs>